tonight on the final play. We kill. We eat. No, no, no. You got it, baby. Here we go. One, two, three. Two, three, four, three, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, eight, 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 a shootout that pushes LSU up to second in the ranking. See all the highlights from a big weekend of football and the Pelicans' latest preseason showcase. From Fox 8 Sports, this is the final play. Sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealers. Built Ford Tough. And by Ron Austin Law. Welcome into the final play. I'm Juan Kincaid. When the day began, every team in the NFC South was chasing the Saints. And if they could get a win in Jacksonville today, the entire NFC could be looking up to them in the standings as well. Sean Bazan gets a starter tonight from Jacksonville. And the NFL wins don't always have to be pretty. In the end, all you really need is more points than your opponent. That pretty much sums up the Saints on Sunday. They did what they had to do. And now they leave Jacksonville five and one. You know, you want to put yourself in position to to win games like this. And uh, you know, I thought we had had that energy, and, and I thought we played with the uh, you know the type of passion you need to play with. Let's go out there today and take hold about this. And it was the defense that led the way as they put forth yet another masterpiece Sunday. Marshawn Lattimore had an interception while Cam Jordan had two sacks. All in all, they yielded just 226 total yards to Jacksonville and just four of 14 third down conversions. Plus, they kept the Jaguars out of the end zone all game. According to their head coach, it could have been longer. I told our defense I felt like if we had played eight quarters, they wouldn't have scored a touchdown today. Honestly. Well, defensively, when we're rolling, we're tough to beat, you know, and so uh, I think we kind of got out there and got into a groove and, um, you know, it just kind of worked in our favor, you know, and you got to, you really, I really commend our guys because that's a tough group, you know. Uh, Jacksonville's been playing some good football, and so to be able to go up against a, a tough team that executes well and be able to get out the field consistently on third down, uh, create, create a takeaway, uh, get some sacks, you know, that was big for us. Part of what aided the defensive effort was field position player most responsible for that was Thomas Morstead. It's rare that a team can walk away from a game feeling like their punter was one of the best players on the field. But that's exactly what Morstead was Sunday. He pinned five of his punts inside the 20 and two inside the 10. I know uh, most Saints fans are not excited when we're punting, but I'm always excited to go out and uh, do my best whenever I'm called upon. I think we've already punted like 60% of last season. So, uh, but hey, we're five and one, and it's been exciting to be a part of this winning atmosphere. Offensively, things didn't come as easy as a week ago. They struggled to move the ball early, and went into halftime with just three points. Teddy Bridgewater admitted his effort just wasn't as sharp as it needed to be. I apologize, uh, DA today, right after the game, told him, man, I'm sorry, you know, I don't wanna have to you know, put you in that situation uh, where you're, you're, you're having a fight all game and we're, we're making it hard on you. Still though, they made enough plays when they had to, like when Bridgewater connected with Jared Cook for a touchdown. <laughs> then hit him again on a crucial third down to move the sticks and essentially seal a 13-6 win on the last drive of the game. The third down play was just a great play uh, called by coach. Um, we knew that uh, we had two options, either front side or the back side, and uh, the defense lost Jared, and he, he made a big play for us. Well, it was a short yardage call. It, it, it felt like the ball was in the air for 20 seconds, really. I mean, it was like, um, you know, it's just a wide hide play. That you kind of get caught in the blocking scheme, and he did a good job of kind of sneaking out the back side, but it seemed like it took forever. We now welcome in our own Deuce McAllister, Saints Hall of Famer Deuce. It ain't got to be pretty. There's no moral victories in the NFL. Ugly win over moral victory any day. Nonetheless, the Saints come to Jacksonville. They get the victory. They get the victory, and like you said, you know, it wasn't the prettiest thing. There's still some things that they can do. They know that they can clean up, and, you know, when you look at it, it's going to be red zone offense, and that's where um, 
you're probably leaving about 10 points on the board. Uh, for them, it's something that they can correct. But it is ha it has been a problem and issue with them, so hopefully they can fix it. It's small things, but it's also you've, you've got to be able to hit on those opportunities. The defense was outstanding. I mean, they've been outstanding really uh, all season, all, all, all season. And so they're getting pressure. The coverage is there. Got one interception. Probably should have had at least two more. Um, hats off to them. They really have played well. And, look, we talked about the stat earlier today in the pregame show. I don't think the Saints trail today again. Yeah. So even when the offense is kind of sputtering, the defense is there to pick them up. I mean, what we've seen out of this unit over the last couple of weeks is really something. This is becoming not just a good or great, perhaps an elite defense right now. Well, I, I think so. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about was them having the ability to get pressure as far as multiple guys. Well, you see Cam Jordan took a little while, but he was able to come up against a rookie uh, tackle, and he was able to, you know, just basically take advantage of it and run defense. We knew it would be question mark whether, you know, they would be able to stop Fournette. Well, he has 20 carries. He only has 70-something rush, uh, odd rushing yards, so you hold him under 100. And, uh, it's just a really, really good effort. It really was. This, this type of win that made uh, former coach Jim Moore proud with these, with these kind of defensive slugfests. Um, Got to talk about Marshawn Lattimore, man. Another week, another shutdown performance. Got the interception. Really blanketed whoever he was covering all game. You could tell Gardner Minshew was struggling because that first read was never there when he was looking for it. What, what was not there, I thought that they did a good job of running the route for the receiver. You know, even Eli Apple, he's close to having a pick over there on the sideline. I mean, he should have had it, got his hands on another one. I thought that they just did a good job of just really, you know, taking the route away from the receivers. And, you know, you talk about Marshawn early on. He's going and traveling with DJ Chark, and, I mean, he was, he was locked in. I mean, he was really, really locked in. And, obviously, we know the pick. He ran an outstanding job. Gardner's thinking that the receiver was going to continue to work. He done. Marshawn is right there, perfect for the interception. You know, it's rare I say this, but I left the field today feeling like of the top two or three performers in that mix was punter Thomas Morstead. I mean, look, the guy pinned. I mean, I think there were uh, four or five inside the 10 or inside the 15. I mean, in a field position type game with the way the defense is playing to constantly put the opposing offense back in bad field position, to me, he was a total weapon today. Well, anytime you have to go 85, 90 yards in the NFL is hard. And so when you can flip the field and win and have them pinned, I know at least three times inside the five, they're on five. You'll take that every time. No doubt about it. And look, Morissette stepped up. Will Lutz was consistent as usual. Offense took him a little while to get going. They got going in the second half. Um, and then you know, there was the play down at the end, the, the Jared Cook touchdown. I think they, they really needed that because I don't know if a 9-6 game would have worked itself out. But it seems like Jared Cook is starting to kind of feel it a little bit within this offense. He's starting to feel it a little bit, and you even you want more. You want more opportunities for him and for him. You know, just uh, I, I know he wants to be more involved, but if they can continue to find ways to get him the football and then continue to work Latavius Murray into that mix, he had probably his most yardage as a Saints as far as running the ball. But, you know, continue to work those guys in. This offense can be very, very dangerous. Did you think he did good? I mean, filling yeah, in for no, Kamara? I, I thought he did a pretty good job, and, you know, they still gave Alvin, you know, a pretty good yeah. workload, maybe not the touches, but I thought that he continued to wear on that defense, and they've got to find more opportunities for him. Well, here we are, four straight wins with Teddy Bridgewater at quarterback. They haven't all looked the same. They go to Chicago next week, but let's kind of put this all in perspective here. I mean, this is pretty impressive what they've been doing. It's very, very impressive what they've been doing, and obviously, you know, you, you expect or you want them to have more production as far as an offense, but, hey, look, if you're winning, it's all that counts. It's all that counts, and right now the Saints are 5-1. and one. Deuce, thank you. No problem. Thank you. Much more coming from Deuce McAllister. Tomorrow morning, beginning with his Black and Gold Rewind at 8 a.m. At 5, Deuce will have his two-minute drill. And tomorrow night at 10.30, Deuce will join us for the Black and Gold Review Show. Get your questions in now. Final play app, final word feature. Much more Saints coverage is coming up after this break as Chris Hagan breaks down the play of the Saints defense. How they were able to bottle up Jags quarterback Gardner Minshew is his focus. And later, it was another impressive weekend for our college football teams. The Saints had to do so many things to win today's game in Jacksonville, and being able to bottle up quarterback Gardner Minshew was near the top of their priority list. Chris Hagan has more. There were three things that stood out about Jacksonville's offense coming into Sunday. 
Gardner Minshew hadn't thrown a single interception as a starter. Leonard Fournette was the league's third leading rusher, averaging more than 100 yards per game. And another former Tiger, DJ Chark, was a big play machine, fifth in the NFL in receiving yards. But all three were non-factors thanks to a great game plan from Dennis Allen and great execution from his Saints defense. So we knew it was going to be a game that was going to be a slugfest. Uh, hats off to the defense, man. You know, those guys have been playing some lights out football lately. The first order of business was Fournette. The Saints made his job tough all day long, never giving him much running room and limiting the New Orleans native to just 3.6 yards per carry. But Minshew at quarterback was the wild card. He's a crafty player when he can get in space and improvise. The key for the Saints, never giving him a chance to. When you talk about, you know, us being accustomed to a scrambling type quarterback, we have a game plan set in motion. I feel like we went out and executed just that, and we made him a, a pocket passer, and we created opportunities for our defense to create turnovers. And of course, and take away his hot spots. We knew where he where he could get, and you know where he felt most comfortable, and try to take that away from. Him. And so it was just a good job all the way around. I think our coverage guys did a great job of taking away the first read, taking away the second read. And uh, it just helped us, you know, Coach get the victory that. today. Teddy Bridgewater said after the game that he apologized to defensive coordinator Dennis Allen, saying the offense should have never put their defense in that situation. But if that's how the black and gold have to win games right now, they'll take them any way they can, especially on the road. Reporting on the Saints, I'm Chris Hagan for the final play. Thanks a lot, Chris. If you're looking for a leg up in fantasy football, check out Hagan's Extra Point blog on fox8live.com and our final play app from advice and in three, two, from advice on who to start and who to sit to forward thinking strategy. Chris has it all for you. Up next on the final play, Garland Gillen will give us a recap on LSU's big win against Florida last night and how that affected them in today's AP rankings. And Tulane just can't stop winning as they covered a 35-point spread against UConn. And then some. We'll go around the boot for a college recap when the final play continues. You're watching the final play. Apparently, the opponent doesn't matter for LSU. They're going to score against anyone. And against Florida last night, the Tigers needed every point they got to hold off the Gators. Garland Gillen was there. The fans were hyped, the team was fired up, and they delivered on the national stage. LSU beat number 7 Florida 42-28, exhibiting once again the Tigers are contenders for a national title. What a night. What a great night for Louisiana State University. It was a... Uh, Top recruits in the country here. Great atmosphere. I want to thank all fans for being the best. It was the best stadium I've ever seen man, at the end. It was, a, it was wonderful to be the head coach at LSU and watch my team in victory and see the fans so happy. A massive turning point in the contest came in the fourth quarter. LSU was leading by seven. Trash looking to throw to the end zone. Diving pick. This Derek Stingley Jr. pick would eventually push the Tigers to victory. Big time players make big time plays and big time games. He's got it. Now, you know, he, he gave up some balls and he gave up some balls. Now, that number 84 was a tremendous football player, one of the best players we've seen all year. Give them credit. But we made the play when we had to. Joe Burrow matches touchdown passes with incomplete passes in the contest with three. The Tigers are now 6 and 0, but the QB still thinks the team has a lot to improve on. You know, I just made a comment that I said don't let good enough get in the way of greatness. Um, and that just means come back to work on Monday ready to go. We still have a lot of room to improve. Um, you know, obviously we're going to enjoy this win, this big win for us and we're going to um, obey the 24-hour rule, but um, I mean, we just can't get complacent cuz we have we have so much more room to improve, so much more to accomplish and I really think we can get there. All right, we're now joined by Brody Miller of The Athletic. Florida is one of the best defenses in the country coming into this contest against LSU. The Tigers drop over 500 yards of offense uh, against this Gator defense. Quite an impressive showing by the team. Absolutely. I mean, this was a Florida defense that was allowing, I think, 4.5 yards per play. LSU averaged 10.6 yards per play tonight. That's the third most in school history, and they did it against a defense that a lot of people said was the best in the country entering tonight. They had, you know, the offensive line shut down the pass rush, didn't allow a sack all night. The run game dominated. Clyde edwards helaire had some massive holes. Everything just worked, and even when the defense was struggling, they were able to rely on that offense. And I think the great greatest victory of all of this is that 
it's no longer the novelty's gone. You know, like, this is just what this offense is. This, this offense can go up against the best in the country and do it every single week. Joe Burrow, only three incompletions, 293 yards passing. It's just another performance where you're like, goodness, and this was against one of the better defenses, as we, we said in the country. This isn't against Texas, a Big 12 defense. This is an SEC defense, one of the top in the country, and Burrow pulled that performance out. Absolutely, because you know his numbers were already off the charts, right? When we're talking Heisman, things like that. But yeah, he hadn't played a great defense yet. He hadn't really been tested on a big, you know, SEC defensive setting. And some of his most impressive plays tonight weren't the big passes or anything like that. It was the first half. Remember when they were, they were starting to get some pressure on him? And he just kept evading, kept getting those little gains. You know, he kept, um, his first touch, second touchdown pass. He rolled around, found Jeff Jefferson in a tight little corner. I mean, he was just on top of his game, and this offense was was borderline perfect against a defense that, if anyone can stop them, it would be Florida. Kyle Trask was almost like Tim Tebow-esque here in Tiger Stadium. Uh, they were up 28-21. It seemed like all the momentum was in Florida's favor. But Dave Aran and that defense took it right back. Yeah, and the narrative was kind of building itself. It would have been the third year in a row that Dan Mullen would have basically had Dave Aranda's number. It would have, I mean, it was pretty bad. It was four touchdowns and five drives. They were moving methodically downfield. Three straight touchdown drives were 10 plays or more. And then they just figured something out. You know, Ed Ogeron puts a lot of the credit to the pressuring more and, you know, starting to send more blitzes. The players didn't quite agree with that. They thought it was more, they just weren't executing the first half. You know, you had that Patrick Queen jump ball that was tipped into somebody's hands. You had the missed tackles on P. Ryan, but he, like they had him in the backfield and they would lose him. They think it was more just execution. But yeah, I mean, this defense buckled down and stopped four to the last four drives of the game, shut them down in the fourth quarter, had stops near the goal line, and kind of answered a lot of criticism about that when the, when the game and season were on the line. One thing we haven't seen much this year, a, a team pick on Derek Stingley Jr. Uh, all game, but he got his revenge. Monster interception toward the back end of the game. Just talk about it, him pers uh, persevering and, and making a big play at the end. Yeah, because keep in mind, this guy just turned 18 years old this summer, you know, and, and he's on the biggest stage in college football right now, and he was getting picked on, he was getting beat, and he was kind of made to look human for once. And and then he makes the, the play that really decided the game, and it's fascinating. I, I had a conversation with Derek Stingley Sr. Uh, about two weeks ago, and he said, you know, the, he's not the next – he's a borderline perfect defender, right? But the, the next step he needs to make is – not just thinking about how to stop a play, but thinking about making the play. Being athletic enough, having the presence of mind to go out there and make the big play when the game's on the line and make that jump ball. And he made that interception that, that sealed the game. That's Brody Miller Athletic. Thanks, bro. With their big win over the Gators, the Tigers are now up to second with 12 first place votes in the latest AP poll, right behind top seed Alabama. The Tigers leapfrog Clemson. Ohio State is now fourth. Oklahoma fifth. Wisconsin coming in at number six. On the Notables page, Florida is down to ninth. Georgia 10th. Both of those teams lost on the weekend. Auburn's 11th at 5 and 1. SMU 6 and 0 at number 19. Cincinnati at number 21. And there's Tulane, 26th based on votes received. And speaking of Uptown, yesterday Tulane was a 35-point favorite to beat the Yukon Huskies, which was the largest line as a favorite they've been since 1998. Well, the Greenies covered and then some. 49 to 7 was the final as the Wave racked up 635 offensive yards. Justin McMillan accounted for three touchdowns, two through the air, the other on the ground. The running game was no slouch as well as they continued to run through opponents, this time for 323 yards as the Wave remained undefeated at home at 4 0 and have achieved their first 5 1 start to the season since 1998. I wouldn't say complete. Um... We still have, we still feel like as a team, we still have more to improve. Um, it's just, I, we, we definitely not complete, though. Down in Thibodeau, the homestand continued for Nichols. They picked up another win, 45 to 35 over Northwestern State. The 12th ranked Colonels got the offense going early and often turning out a season high, 537 total offensive yards. Nichols led by as much as 24 points early on. Quarterback Chase 4K, who usually is pretty dominant with his arm, found more success running the ball against the Demons. 14 carries for him, a career high, 135 yards rushing. It was his first 100-yard game rushing of his career. 4K also had two touchdown runs, and the Colonels had 349 yards rushing on the day. Up in Hammond, Southeast's homecoming was ruined by Incarnate Word, but the Lions did a lot to themselves. They had 515 total offensive yards, but they also had six turnovers against the visiting Cardinals. Four picks, two fumbles. Quarterback Chase on Virgil had his fifth straight 300-plus yard passing game, but he also set a career high with four interceptions. 
Just a bad day for the Lions in that 27-21 loss. So here is next week's schedule. Nichols goes back on the road to face Sam Houston State. LSU will be away from Baton Rouge and Starkville to face Mississippi State. Tulane has a tough one on the road at nationally ranked Memphis. And the Southeastern Lions will take the weekend off. It's a bye week for them. Coming up on the final play, we'll check in on the Pelicans who continue their preseason play in San Antonio this afternoon. And for more Saints talk, check out episode 85 of the Foxy Overtime podcast. It's up and waiting for you right now. So too is episode 84 with some LSU chat on it. Following their big winning against Florida. You can find our podcast on fox8live.com, the final play, and Tiger Huddle apps, and of course, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Time now for your play of the week, sponsored by Ron Austin Law. Our play of the week comes from the high school ranks where Warren Easton's Alfred Luke fills the kickoff return. After it bounces around, he finally picks it up and finds some openings in the Holy Cross coverage. He keeps going and going and going 93 yards. But that play was not enough as the Eagles fell to Holy Cross. Here are this week's Player of the Week nominees. Jesuit quarterback Grant Jordan, two passing touchdowns, two rushing touchdowns against St. Aug. Ponchatoula QB TJ Finley continues to make hay up there. 469 yards passing, four touchdown throws, and a rushing TD against Mandeville. And then there's Pearl River running back Corey Warren. 220 yards rushing, big day for him. Four touchdown runs against North Lake Christian. To vote, go to fox8live.com slash player. Voting opens tomorrow and closes on Wednesday. Now to the NBA, where we're hoping the preseason is a sign of things to come for the Pelicans, who have won their first three games, including their only home game Friday night against the Utah Jazz. Today, they continue their preseason play in San Antonio against the Spurs. Pels down by 10 at the break. They came back in the third quarter. Lonzo, Zion, how about that combination? Tied at 68. The Pels begin pulling away Nikhil Alexander-Walker. They call him Naw, three-pointer. 89-79, Naw at 13 points off the bench, Pels up by 10, Zion 22 points, 10 rebounds. Pelicans rally to win again, 123-114. They will wrap up the preseason on Friday in New York, then focus on the opener in Toronto against the Raptors. That will be on the 22nd. The home opener will be on the 25th against the Dallas Mavericks. And that's our show for tonight. For all of us here at Fox 8, I'm Juan Kincaid. We hope you'll join us again next Sunday night for the final play. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been The Final Play. Sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealers. Built Ford Tough. And by Ron Austin Law.